Okay, it's a minute after the hour, so let's make a start. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today um, for this session on inclusive language. My name's Caroline Porter. I'm a trustee of COPE and I'm Associate Vice President at, for Research Publishing at SAGE. And it's really good to be with you today. Okay, so for our agenda today, we are exploring what role, if any, journals and publishers should play in assessing content for inclusivity. And this is part of a series of workshops and webinars COPE has been facilitating over the last few years to explore DEI issues in relation to research integrity and publication ethics. So we, um, I have a, a short intro to, to give to you, which will share some results from a survey that COPE conducted of the membership, just to ascertain what sort of issues you are dealing with around inclusivity or otherwise, of language in publications, and what, if any, guidance you would find useful from COPE. We will then have opening remarks from each panel member, and I'm really delighted that we have three wonderful speakers with us today. Sarah Dabari is based at JAMA Psycho Psychiatry, and she led on the C4 DISC guidelines on inclusive language and images in scholarly communication. Rohan Pethiagoda is Managing Trustee for the Wildlife Heritage Trust of Sri Lanka and Research Associate at the Australian Museum, Sydney. Lisa Richardson is Associate Dean for, um, for Inclusion and Diversity at, at Tamati Fest Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto. We're keen to have lots of time for discussion and uh, Q&A from, from participants, and we've left, we've got roughly 45 minutes for that once our panel members have, um, have presented their opening thoughts. I'm now going to walk through the results from the survey that we conducted of the membership. Um, we had over 200 responses, which was, was really great to see, which meant that we got a good range of, um, of answers and hopefully that will be of interest to everyone here. So in terms of the, the how people encounter scholarly publication, and we had the majority of participants were journal editors, but we also had authors, researchers, publishers, university administrators, and or research integrity specialists participating. Next slide. We asked if your journal or publisher or university has policies or workflows or guidance around inclusive language. And most of, a lot of you said yes, quite a few of you said no, and um, a number of you were not sure. So that's, that's interesting. It's quite a, quite a range of responses there. Next slide, please. We also asked if your journal or publisher or university uses any particular style guides or resources to help their decision making around inclusive language. And C4DISC, APA, ACS and AMA all get some usage here. There's also a number, uh, the, the majority of you use other um, guides, including in-house style manu manuals, government guidelines, publisher guidance, or other resources. Next slide, please. This answer was around how many of you have encountered issues of problematic or offensive language in submitted content. Fairly evenly split um, in terms of the number of people who answered the question. So hopefully, the session today will be of interest and of use to you, whether you have encountered um, this issue or in preparing you in the event that you do in the future. Next slide, thank you. We also asked when encountering problematic or offensive language, how you have dealt with this. Um, a number of you have required the author to change the language or encouraged the author to, to change the language. Um, some of you have decided not to take any action. Others have decided to work with authors, editors and copy editors to address it or change the language in production. 
but it's interesting to see that uh, the, the majority of the respondents here have either required or encouraged the author to make some changes. Next slide, please. We also had a number of free text um, questions and we couldn't capture all of them here. Uh, so we've just got some exam some sort of representative answers. So in, in answer to the question, can you give some examples of how this issue manifests in your context? We've got a number of different kind of responses here. Often use of terms that are not considered offensive in one part of the world, but are in others. And, and also this issue can sometimes involve language barriers or poor translation. Another person commented that the language around disability is particularly problematic. Even the word disability is a problem, problem because there is a strong argument that the person is not disabled, but the environment is disabling. Another respondent felt that the APA style manual is very specific. And um, for example, it, it, it requires person first language and that person, that individual follows that guide very closely. Sometimes authors are not aware of updated inclusive language or terminology, or they may not be aware of the context in a different geographical region. And sometimes they're agreeable to changing the language. In this person's case, sometimes they have authors who are not willing to change the language or are submitting harmful content, content and that gets just rejected. And the final comment here, over the past eight years that I have worked with indigenous people, there have been many ways that language has changed. It has often been hard to find the correct words or terms in this context. It is necessary to work very closely with Indigenous women to, co to adopt the correct language or words. This is a really important part of research amongst Indigenous people because it seems that even individuals among the community may have different perceptions of what is correct. Next slide, please. The next question asked what the key concerns are um, if any, about approaching this issue. And I think these, uh, again, it's, this is a, a representative sample of the comments. Um, some people feel that the issue can be very emotive ha and having clear guidance from COPE would be helpful. A, a number of people commented that, that language preferences seem to be changing rapidly and it's hard to keep up. It's also, um, a challenge to ensure take up or buy in from editors, board members and authors, and also really challenging to create some kind of consistency across the publishing ecosystem. There's also a really great couple of really great questions here. When sh where should we draw the line between recommendations and mandatory requirements? And how much should we rely on independent board members to decide? Also, how involved should internal editors working for publishers be? Somebody has commented about how to take regional and cultural differences um, into account about what are acceptable terms when creating guidelines. How to promote inclusivity and sensitivity around language while not censoring authors' texts. How to create guidelines that will help people make informed decisions about various topics. And then a final comment, the balance between freedom of authors to use terminology they deem fit and ensuring our content is not unduly offensive or inappropriate. There's a sense of cultural colonialism and applying Western concepts and sensitivities to an international authorship and readership. So I think there's a, a number of really um, important concerns being expressed here. And I really hope that through our discussion today, we can dig into some of these issues. And I know that our panel members have some really great thoughts um, that will help us discuss this and bring some clarity. Next slide, please. Finally, we asked participants to describe what sort of guidance or guidance areas they would find helpful. And we had a number of, uh, again, a number of responses here. Some people would, would love to have guideline, guidelines about how to encourage or advise authors to change wording, what actions journals or publishers should be taking in these cases. Some feel that established laws, for example, the US law on freedom of expression already handles such matters very well. 
people would value uh, some support in how to handle situations where there's no strong consensus or a changing consensus about whether a particular term is problematic and how to hang handle language issues in accepted manuscripts. Others are asking for guidance that is not only applicable to English language, and I think it's that's a really important issue. I know I'm aware that I come to this conversation with a lot of privilege myself, including um, white privilege, but also the fact that English is my first language. Another person has commented that language interpretations are so broad that they wouldn't expect COPE to produce a dictionary of acceptable terms, and but perhaps to compile a list of resources that address using appropriate language. And I think that's a, a great point. And um, COPE uses the C4 DISC guidance um, where appropriate when we're um, developing our resources ourselves. And finally, somebody has said it would be useful to have a singular trusted resource to point authors to with high level guidance that could apply to a variety of inclusive language issues. And that could um, be a collection of resources and considerations, checklists for reviewers, maybe a curated list of frequently encountered situations in certain disciplines or fields. So a big thank you to everyone who participated um, in the survey. It was really great to hear from so many of you. We're now going to move on to our panel discussion. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah and look forward to hearing what you have to say, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to discuss today a little bit about the guidelines on inclusive language in images and scholarly communication, which um, was a project that was put together by the Coalition for Diversity and Inclusion in Scholarly Communication, or C4 DISC. I'll cover the motivations and goals, the approach, some challenges and limitations that we faced, um, have an example of a recent correction due to language, and then cover the future of the guidelines. Um, I would also like to note that opinions are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the JAMA Network or the American Medical Association. So why did we need inclusive language guidelines? C4DISC notes in its joint statement of principles that increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion in scholarly communications is a moral imperative. In the December 2022 issue of Science Editor, Dr. Leonard Jack wrote a commentary on the Council of Science Editors um, recommendations for promoting integrity in scientific journal publications. He said that content assessed for publication in scientific journals and articles eventually published are not immune from bias. In fact, bias against individuals because of their race, gender, religion, disability, education, institutional setting, career status, sexual orientation, spoken language, and other characteristics remain a pressing issue in scientific publishing. Uh, so the motivations behind creating these guidelines were to address the growing need for more comprehensive and global guidelines for the use of language and images that are inclusive and culturally sensitive, to address various forms of conscious and unconscious bias and discrimination found in published scholarly research, and to expand upon the C4DISC toolkits for equity project. The goals behind um, the toolkits are to set an industry standard that promotes proactive, inclusive writing habits, to serve as a global tool and educational resource that can be used by individuals, institutions, and publishers, and to serve as a living archive that links to current literature on the topic and other community-specific inclusive language guidelines. There were a variety of subject-specific guidelines and general recommendations such as those from the AMA and APA. But at the time this project was launched, there was no comprehensive guidelines on inclusive languages and not very much guidelines on inclusive images in scholarly communication. Although some have been um, released in the interim such as the one from the American Chemical Society. The guidelines were created by a working group of more than 30 professionals from around the world. 
And we strove to provide recommendations on how to use words and images that promote inclusion and to provide principles and rationale to equip people with knowledge to choose the most inclusive words, even as terminology, terminology preferences change, rather than just providing a list of words to use and not use, although the guidelines do include um, some examples. The guidelines are not intended as a tool for censorship or to police or silence authors. Uh, the guidelines apply to a range of professionals and situations, not only authors, reviewers, and editors, but also publishers, scholarly societies, researchers, librarians, and so forth. The biggest challenge in creating these guidelines was to determine the scope of the project. We wanted to be as all-encompassing as possible without being so broad that the guidelines were vague, but we knew that we didn't want to strictly limit it to just journal and book publishing because there's so much more to scholarly communication. There's also conflicting recommendations and regional differences in language is constantly evolving, which were also challenges. Another challenge was avoiding our own biases. Um, everyone has biases, whether they're conscious or not. When we were deciding how to frame the guidelines, we tried to be cognizant of this, and we tried hard to avoid a Eurocentric or Western point of view. In my opinion, the biggest limitation that we had was a lack of geographical diverse, diversity. As I said, the full working group included more than 30 people. I chaired the research and writing teams, which consisted of 13 people total, and we were the most diverse team within the working group. So within my teams and the full working group, we resided in six countries. Five of those were high income economies and one an upper middle income economy, according to the World Bank classifications. But both in my team and within the full working group, there were only two people who reside outside of Europe and North America. So as I said, we try to be as inclusive as possible, but it's also hard to know what you don't know, even with research. Um, here's an example of a recent correction. Um, this comes from my own journal, JAMA Psychiatry. We published a genetics paper in our February issue, and in the method sections, the authors noted that quality control included the removal of individuals of non-European descent. We received a letter to the editor about this paper, and you can see a line from it here. The letter writer said, it is perpetually disheartening that there are such limited data on non-European populations but for the authors to describe removal of individuals of non-European descent from the analysis as quality control is unacceptable. The most generous interpretation is that the authors were simply careless in their language. All this leads one to think that the careless language reflects underlying assumptions that a focus on individuals of European descent is normal, ordinary, and possibly even desirable. How can we expect change if the journal doesn't follow through and acknowledge the problem? JAMA Psychiatry published this letter to the editor, as well as a letter in reply from the authors of the original article and um, an editor's note from the editor-in-chief and diversity, equity, and inclusion editor. The article was corrected as well. You can see the correction here, which noted the problematic language from the original article and also includes the updated language. The article now states, included the removal of related individuals as well as individuals of non-European descent. The latter was to ensure that the models would not use ancestry as a proxy for potential imbalances of the disorders in the data set. So the article now includes a scientific rationale for excluding individuals of non-European descent, which is more useful to the understanding of the article. In their letter in reply, the authors of the original article acknowledged that their description was insensitive and open to misunderstanding. In the editor's note, um, the editor-in-chief and the diversity, equity, and inclusion editor of JAMA and Psychiatry said, we must not stand by use of careless, incorrect, imprecise, or insensitive language to report methods and findings of research, 
just as we would not allow publication of carelessly conducted research. So essentially, everyone makes mistakes. It's important to own these mistakes and to correct them in order to do better in the future. So where do we go from here? The C4 DISC guidelines are intended to be updated regularly. C4 DISC also has a forthcoming toolkit for disability equity, um, which I personally hope will help expand the section on accessibility within the image guidelines, which is not as comprehensive as we had hoped it would be. C4 DISC also encourages suggestions and recommendations from the community, which can be sent to c4disc at gmail.com. Finally, I leave you with this quote from Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. In my opinion, this is the basis for inclusive language everywhere. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Sarah. That was fascinating. And I love that final quote. I think we would all do well to um, approach things in that way. OK, um, we're now going to um, to show uh, the, the presentation from Rohan Pethiagoda. So, Elisa, would you mind um, launching that, please? I want to focus particularly on the reforms proposed recently in editorials and opinion pieces in major journals that argue for the removal from the lexicon of words and terms that may be offensive to the peoples of the post-colonial world. That is to say, people like myself. This includes, for example, the replacement of hundreds of botanical names that reference the word kaffir, the equivalent of the N-word in the colonial era, a deeply offensive word. The most sweeping of these reforms involves the invalidation of offensive eponymous taxa, taxa named after morally deficient people, such as the Beatle and Ophthalmus Hitleri, which of course references Adolf Hitler. There are thousands of scientific names that are inappropriate, offensive, or associated with people who held views that are utterly repugnant by the standards of our time. But where should we draw the moral boundary? Who should be the arbiter? This uncertainty has led to calls to invalidate eponyms altogether. But that raises a new problem. What will be the fate of taxa named for non-white people? For example, the species of spider named Anilocymus nelsoni after Nelson Mandela. And don't forget that a great many words in common use, as well as most standard international units, are eponyms the ampere, the newton, the joule, and so on. Should the association of James Watt with the slave trade cause us to replace his eponymous unit of power? The fact is, eponyms abound. Do we really care about the moral hygiene of the people they commemorate? Your surname, after all, is very likely an eponym. Alongside calls to delete eponyms from the lexicon have been demands to expunge words that might offend marginalized groups. These include, for example, the word alien, as in alien species, because it could hurt the feelings of people regarded as aliens by the US government, even though that usage is, well, alien to the rest of the world. There isn't time to list other examples, there are many, but I will make one observation about the authors calling for these reforms. They're almost all exclusively white or based predominantly in white majoritarian countries. Despite the debate being about the sensitivities of post-colonial peoples, people of color, our voices rarely make it into the opinion pages of your journals. The editorials of many journals have been reduced to echo chambers in what has become a white on white debate, a debate that excludes post-colonial voices. I don't doubt for one moment that you are well-intentioned. Yet many among you choose to speak for us, to know what our feelings are, and seek to redress the harms of colonialism and slavery by revising language. Past harms that your ancestors inflicted on my ancestors. You seem to imagine that words will somehow set you free. 
I want you to think for a moment just how absurd, how offensive that idea is, how condescending, how patronizing. Scientific terms that are offensive may well warrant reform, but shouldn't it be us, the so-called victims, that demand these reforms? I would argue that you seek to impose language that you deem to be inclusive upon the post-colonial world, not so much on the grounds that arguably offensive words harm us, people like myself, but because you want somehow to dissociate yourselves from the odious heritage of the West. If reform is needed, it is ours to demand, not yours to dispense, to bestow upon us. It should not be the voice of white privilege dictating once more to the non-white world what words we shall use, deciding on our behalf what hurts us and what doesn't, as if you would know, as if you even could know. All you do by expunging words from the lexicon, by defacing statues of your colonial heroes, by demolishing your monuments, by censoring your literature, is to seek to deny your past. Are you really doing these things for us? It's akin to Poland deciding unilaterally that Auschwitz is offensive to Jews and so demolishing it. Or Germany deciding that the word Holocaust evokes unpleasant memories in Holocaust survivors and so prohibiting its use. I don't deny that there are words and terms in the scientific lexicon that are offensive to the post-colonial world. Of course there are. But when it comes to such reforms, the Western world almost always acts purely out of self-interest. Let me give you a recent example. It relates to the genus of trees known as Acacia. These are called wattles in Australia, and one of them even forms part of Australia's national emblem. Then research showed that the Australian wattles belong to another genus, that the name Acacia correctly belonged to an Afro-Asian species. But Australia was determined to claim the name for itself. There's no time to tell the whole story here, but suffice it to say that the matter was taken to the International Botanical Congress of 2011. And there, it was decided that the rules of botanical nomenclature would be overridden, set aside, and the name Acacia awarded to Australia. Africans would simply have to suck it up and settle for a different name for their trees. Where did this International Congress take place? Need you ask, in Melbourne, Australia. How inclusive was it of African voices? Well, judge for yourself. And where was the proposal to deprive Africa of this name debated? Behind the paywall of taxon which charges a subscription of 928 US dollars per year. That is more than the per capita GDP of 20 African countries. So here's why I point to the hypocrisy of the West when it comes to reforming the scientific lexicon. On the one hand, changing the names of some hundreds of species of Australian bottles was alleged to be too difficult, too inconvenient for that great technologically advanced nation. Yet we in the developing world are now told we must replace thousands of putatively offensive taxonomic names and plunge botanical nomenclature into chaos. In the midst, mind you, of a global biodiversity emergency. Merely to assuage your guilt for colonialism? Is this what they call equity nowadays? I suspect many of you would have seen the movie Oppenheimer. There, towards the end, the disgraced Oppenheimer is assured that one day, posterity will restore his reputation. But when that day comes, Einstein warns him, it won't be for you. It will be for them that they do it. That, in my view, is what the West attempts to cleanse the scientific lexicon in the name of inclusion amounts to. You are doing it to salve your guilt, to signal your virtue. You are certainly not doing it for us, the so-called victims of the colonial enterprise. What value would the American constitution have had if, instead of beginning with the proud assertion, we the people, it began with a royal concession. I, George III, King of England. How devoid of meaning, of significance that would have been. Yet that is precisely what you seek to do. Shakespeare understood this problem well. 
After she murders the king, Lady Macbeth is distraught, not because of her crime, but because she can't erase her guilt, the blood on her hands. She washes them, she rubs them, she wrings them. Her anguish is intolerable. Out, damn spot, she cries. Out, I say. Will these hands ne'er be clean? Here's the smell of blood still. Not all the perfumes of Arabia will sweeten this little hand. Don't imagine for one moment that words alone will sweeten the little hand of colonial oppression. Of course it is true that words create our reality. I get that. It is also true that words matter and that their meanings matter and that words evoke feelings. I understand that. But words come into being through usage, not through imposition. All you succeed in doing in the name of this brand of inclusion is victimizing yet again the victims of colonialism. By what measure is this not the quintessence of the white privilege of which you speak so much? What then, I hear you ask, is the way forward? Well, how about asking your national academies, the Royal Society for instance, to engage with their counterparts worldwide and assess perceptions and attitudes relating to academic language. After all, national academies for the sciences, the arts, the letters, the humanities, these exist pretty much in every country. What would be so wrong in seeking their views, our views? Isn't that what inclusion is supposed to be all about? Thank you. Thank you, Rohan, for that incredibly thought-provoking presentation. I'm going to hand over now to Lisa Richardson. Thank you so much. And um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. It's early in the morning. I'm situated in Toronto. Um, I'm on the traditional land of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, um, and here on Wendat. And currently we have Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island living here. My name is Lisa Richardson. My background is Anishinaabe, um, which is a First Nation group here in Canada. My traditional territory is called Shevanoning. Um, I'm European on my father's side of mixed ancestry. The process of a land acknowledgement is something that's come into practice here in the land now known as Canada over the last 10 years. We've just come through the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation on September the 30th. That day was created just several years ago to recognize the significant harms, the actual cultural genocide that occurred when uh, the government of Canada created the residential school system where First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples were taken from their families and experienced significant harm. In fact, what occurred several years ago is the unearthing of the bodies of children on the sites of those former residential schools. So what we now know are that thousands of peoples, Indigenous peoples died in the school. As you can see, we're at a significant point of need for social transformation in our country. And the reason I wanted to speak about the land acknowledgement is thinking about it as a practice a guideline that was suggested and supported and how we've seen it taken up in the last 10 years or so in the same way guidelines for inclusive language could change the culture or begin to change the culture of publishing. So what we see now are that although people initially were not necessarily comfortable in acknowledging their territory or the land in which they were situated, uh, it, what has evolved is the commitment to learning, to understand whose land, who are the original peoples who continue to inhabit the space where your institution, um, school, uh, uh, office is located, and to really force oneself to learn about that. And now what we see in many land acknowledgements is actually not just a reading of text, but is a personal reflection on how one's own situation actually relates to that land acknowledgement. So it is an example of introducing a practice that is changing the understanding of non-Indigenous peoples in Canada with their Indigenous colleagues, 
and the nations with whom they're in relationship. So I argue or believe strongly that changes to language in the publishing industry are an amazing start, but they certainly are, must be part of a much larger strategy. We know that academic spaces have not been welcoming places. And before we go on, I wanted to point out that often when I speak, I actually specifically choose not to use slides. And it's not that I don't know how to create um, you know, beautiful PowerPoint. It's actually because I want to disrupt the usual practices of knowledge translation that have been dominant in certain spaces. And I want to uphold the power of oratory, which is a traditional form of knowledge translation that continues to exist in our communities. So as I said, we know that our academic spaces have not been welcoming places. There are lots of, in my role as associate dean, I hear many, many stories of mistreatment of learners, stereotyping bias, lack of recognition of their work. In fact, uh, the one of the papers that I love, and I'm gonna speak to a few papers to just look at the broader context in, where, in which we're working was published by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2020. And they call it the Di diversity innovation paradox. It was Hofstra et al. And what they point out, they use this expansive machine learning and AI model actually, and looked at the theses the, of uh, all PhD graduates in the US between 1977 and 2015 and followed their careers in their faculty positions and demonstrated that those from gender and racial from uh, minorities actually had through their AI algorithm likely more innovative contributions, but they also demonstrated that their work was less likely to be taken up and it was less likely to support a larger career. And this is through the analysis of 1.2 million US doctoral students. So we have a representation problem that continues to exist, and we do need specific strategies to do that to do so. In order to sort of take up in another way how instituting guidelines and practices can help to change culture, I point to the uh, the uh, uh, new accreditation standards, well, they're no longer new, actually, they were initiated in 2009 in the United States by the Liaison Committee on Medical Education around diversity. And there were two accreditation standards admit, uh, initiated in 2009 that required all medical schools to actually have systematic ways in which to address the underrepresentation of certain groups within medicine. And a recent a paper that Bo Wright Paul, uh, and colleagues published in JAMA in 2018 actually looked at what happened to those entering medical schools between 2002 and 2017. And over that period, they knew that each school would have been accredited because the minimum amount of time or the maximum amount of time between accreditation cycles was eight years. And they demonstrated how with the introduction of these standards, there was an increase in the number of black students in medicine, the number of women in medicine, of the number of Asian students in medicine, and of the number of Latinx Hispanics in medicine. So having structured approaches is helpful. But I really, I, 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 so I applaud the C4 DISC guidelines. And what I love about what Sarah reminded us is that these are meant to provide principles and rationale to equip people with knowledge to choose the most inclusive words, even as terminology involves. In other words, any guideline is not a, a clear signal to say, can't use this, must use this. It is meant to help people enter into their own learning and dialogue and give them direction. It is um, an opportunity for providing feedback, growth, and learning, as we saw in the example that Sarah described around the JAMA Psychiatry. Now, what I would hope would be the next step for JAMA Psychiatry is to say, how do we make sure that we're actually reaching out to recruit or to, to support submissions from authors who are outside of, the, of their usual uh, author authorship groups. 
And I think that is what leads me into my final point, which is this cannot be a single initiative. There are so many other practices that are critical to ensuring we create more representation within publishing. By the way, one of the things I love about the C4 DIS guideline, Sarah, is that you talk about not just the words, because I think we get caught, we, we say, oh, you can't use this word, you can't use that word. No, you talk about framing. One of the most critical things, for example, for Indigenous peoples in Canada when we speak about research is we are sick and tired of deficit-based stories and research that is published showing that we have high rates of diabetes, high rates of chronic illness, less likely to get transplant, more likely to have mental illness. It is incredibly frustrating and can be dehumanizing to constantly read that. I wanted to point to a counter example based on the work that was published by a colleague of mine, Carolyn Kramer, who is a Brazilian Indigenous scholar. She submitted a piece to, to the Lancet, and it was based on the Lancet's commitment and creation of, a, of the Grace Group, which is a, commit, a cr commitment to racial equity, to actually have special editions of the journal to encourage submissions from people across the globe. And what that paper actually showed is the increase in how increases in urbanization changed the cardiometabolic outcomes of Indigenous peoples in Brazil. In, in other words, with increased deforestation, we saw uh, increased rates of adverse cardiometabolic events. That is the kind of paper that is so critical for Indigenous peoples, but that we don't usually see unless we have these targeted commitments. So I wanted to lift up this idea of how do we actually create structural change within your journals that are well beyond just having guidelines around language. Who is sitting on your board? So have you made efforts to reach out to communities across the globe? Have you made re efforts to have representation and perspectives of people with disabilities, of, of Indigenous peoples, of peoples from, as I said, all different parts of the globe, of people from sexual minorities, LGBTQ2S folks? Are we doing education and mentorship within the journals to encourage people from all backgrounds, particularly those who are underrepresented, to develop careers as editors and publishers? Are we creating safe environments when we recruit people to the institution? And as I said, ending on the point around the advisory boards and special groups, as we wait for these journals to become more diverse, how are we in the interim creating that in, those inclusive perspectives? that are often not seen. I'm gonna leave it at that because I'm sure we'll have many questions. Thank you so much to all of my colleagues. Really enjoyed the comments by Rohan and Sarah McWitch. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you to all three of our wonderful panelists. I can see that there's some questions coming in. Um, so just a reminder to participants, please post questions or comments in the Q&A. And let's, uh, let's kick off by asking um, this question, which comes from an anonymous attendee. Do you have any suggestions on how we can make language more inclusive whilst also acknowledging the past at the same time? Lisa, do you want to kick us off on that one? Yes, thanks. That's an excellent question. The reason I situated myself at the beginning of my talk is that is an, it is an extremely important act, I think, about understanding why we're at where we're at right now. I would love to actually see journals doing the same thing. Understanding how journals and science has actually participated in colonial violence and in ongoing uh, ongoing acts that have been harmful. And so I think that idea of actually asking not only authors to situate themselves, but journals to do the same 
And perhaps even you could imagine a statement at the beginning. It's like we do we do that here now all the time. You know, our office is located here and this on this territory. That's a part of acknowledging what has occurred in terms of those Crown Indigenous relations here in Canada. So I think um, I think that's something I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm brainstorming here ways in which we could see um, journals really acknowledging their own history, their own role, being transparent about their own metrics of who's working where, et cetera, and then asking authors to be doing the same. Thank you, Lisa. Rohan, um, what are your comments on this? And the question was, do you have any suggestions on how we can make language more inclusive whilst also acknowledging the past at the same time? Thank you, Caroline. Um, I see this as a two-step process. On the one hand, journals have to have criteria for inclusion. There's, there's no doubt about that. I think this is well established now. But that is only one element of this problem. The other more complex side of this is on what do you found the rules, if you wish, for inclusion? Whom do you consult? Who guides you? And journals speak to an international audience, obviously. But how often do you hear the voice of the international audience? It's not easy to do, even, even when you want to. And so that's why I suggested in, in my address that we look, for example, to the National Academies of Sciences to find out what the problems are. For example, I gave the example of the really offensive word CAFA or CAFRA that's incorporated in some hundreds of botanical names that are still used in the scientific literature. This is an offensive word about Africans. And if you don't listen to African voices, voice, this is not a word that's used in the Northern American context, for example. So if you don't use listen to African voices, which could e best be reflected by the African National Academies of Science and find other cases like that of hurtful or harmful words, we will not be able to address them. So that's why I feel that journals should open themselves up to advice from some forum and the National Academies present themselves uh, to, to guide the evolution of language uh, going forward, rather than making this largely a North American and European enterprise that we seek opinion from a wider constituency across the globe. Yes, absolutely. And I think it it's incumbent on us all to, to engage with wider communities than that where we're based. Sarah, what are your thoughts on this question? Do you have any suggestions on how we can make language more inclusive whilst also acknowledging the past at the same time? From my perspective as a managing editor, I think it's important to acknowledge the limitations of your research. Um, so, for example, in the correction that we publish, acknowledging that genetics papers are often about white people because that is the most data that is collected, but that is a limitation. Or language that I have seen um, more recently about um, in papers dealing with pregnancy is that the individuals in the paper are referred to as women, but the authors acknowledge that the, the participants may not all identify as, as women. Um, so you can you can acknowledge the the language of the past while still trying to move the field forward um, with more inclusive terms. Thank you. Um, and actually, some of the some of your comments about that question and the importance of sort of engaging and and uh, enabling representation of of different voices. Um, leads on to a couple of related questions actually that have been posed. Um, one anonymous attendee says, thank you, Rohan, for your powerful words. Do you have any thoughts on what's sometimes called the diversity tax, where the burden is said to fall on those who are marginalized to address issues of diversity, equity and inclusivity? 
we have a, a, a related question from another attendee saying, does the panel have any thoughts or suggestions on how to involve people from marginalised communities without burdening them? So, Rohan, may I invite your thoughts on that to start us with? Um, thank you. I don't think communities across the post-colonial world will feel that they're being burdened if their views are sought, and that's something we haven't done. I think they'd feel refreshed by the idea of being able to contribute their views to these problems, because these problems, even outside uh, of their own countries, can have different solutions because different words are used in different contexts in different landscapes. For example, again, going back to the offensive word that was used about white uh, by white South Africans about of black people, kaffir. In the country I'm in at the moment, in Sri Lanka, that's a perfectly inoffensive word. It's, it's used uh, a community of African descent applied to themselves and call themselves Kafirs. But of course, it's a really bad word in Africa. But unless we have the conversation between countries in which it's offensive and countries in which it's innocuous, we can't find out what word we should use going forward or that we should in some way cleanse the lexicon of such words. So I think opening a forum for international dialogue on the evolution of language, specifically English, because English is now predominantly the language of science, is, is something that we need to pay attention to. I don't think this is, it's fair to leave this to editors alone. I think we need to look at a wider constituency of opinion from across the world, because it's a complex subject and every country has its own uh, peculiarities in this respect. When it comes to, for example, changing the names of species, very often species transgress boundaries. Species don't occur within political boundaries, they go to the next country. So if you apply a, a local word from one country, it can even be offensive to another country. And that's why Latin has become such a handy thing because nobody likes it and everyone's forced to have it. So I, I think opening this up to a discussion across a wider international community is, is something that we really need to pay attention to. And that has not been addressed up to now. Thank you, Rohan. Um, Sarah, your comments on that, please. Does the panel have thoughts or suggestions on how to involve people from marginalized communities without burdening them? Um, I think, especially in countries like the United States and, and countries in Europe, the the easiest thing to do is to avoid diversity tax is to pay the people whose um, knowledge you're seeking. Um, often the people from minority backgrounds are asked to speak or serve in positions that are unpaid, especially a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion editors. You're asking them to take on additional work, but they're not being compensated. Even if, for example, if it's in an academic position is something else being taken off their plate so they have the time to focus on that without taking away from their research or burdening their overall time commitment. And I think it's also important to include people on an equal footing. Don't just ask them to do the work and then throw them in the acknowledgments. Make them a co-author or give them a seat on the board or you know, something that is more equal and gives them a voice instead of just, you know, a little line at the end to acknowledge um, their input. It, it seems that way, in my opinion, that you're taking credit for their work. Absolutely. And Lisa, um, your thoughts on this issue of um, trying to not to overburden people from marginalized communities? Uh, I, I really wanted to echo the comments that Rohan made about looking, you know, who who can be partnered with um, in in other in what organizations from other parts, uh, you know, non-European, non-North American uh, uh, parts of the world are engaged. So I think that that's important because we we have an expression, nothing about us without us. So there needs to be meaningful partnership. And I, I really, we don't use the word consultation anymore. 
for indigenous peoples here, we have very, in Canada, we've had, we've really been very insistent. You want to just talk to us about this study? No, we actually need a research agreement with you. We need to see a research agreement, which demonstrates how we will, we will be involved from the very beginning design stages through to ensuring that whoever has been involved is, is an author on the paper. So that uh, though, those that meaningful partnership is so critical. It, uh, so just that's just an, another thought from about how important these um, these partnerships are because I think the way in which we're still imagining this is sort of seeking opinions and reaching out. And what we're talking about is a full scale actually change in the structure of of the journals and of the whole industry because it's no longer going to be a minority tax if you're ensuring that you actually have that uh, depth of representation within your journal itself. So that people are in paid positions and that they're being um, you know, properly supported to provide their perspectives. When I first started at our medical school, there was one other indigenous faculty member. Through all of our programming and development and mentorship pathways, um, 10, 11 years later, we now have eight or nine or 10, between eight and 10 faculties. Some people work around uh, uh, across, the, across the country. So, you know, these efforts, it's a long-term strategy to actually change your own, in your own organizations, but they mu it must be done thoughtfully and intentionally. And in the meantime, who are your partners that you're working with? Absolutely. And it, it, it's, I think what, what what you're all saying is that it's important to embed the the views of multiple backgrounds and communities without being tokenistic, but to to bring those views into the very core of what a journal or a, or a um, research project is trying to achieve. And um, there's a there's a comment from a, an attendee here saying the real diversity tax seems to be associated more closely with the checkbox need to diversify groups. For some groups, it is more show than action. And do we actually listen to those that we ask to join such groups? And I think that's um, a, a really important um, comment and, and one that we would all do well to be mindful of when we're considering these issues. Um, on a related note, we have um, a question that has been um, directed to Lisa, but I'd be very glad of other comments on it too. Um, should journals structure their boards to show the groups they are representing, or should this be left for the readers and authors to figure it out by researching the board members' backgrounds? So Lisa, do you want to comment on that first? Sorry, just to clarify, clarify that was should should we be actually being transparent about who's on who's on our editorial boards and what their backgrounds are? Yeah, that, Absol that's absolutely. Absolutely. So that there are there are there are um, there are some inter I, I think knowing what the makeup is is of uh, an an organization creates um, may create a sense of safety. And there, there's some really, uh, there's so many examples of that. One of my favorite papers that looks to that actually is in, um, was just in the primary care literature. And it was published uh, just in April, in April of 2023, actually showing that a single black primary care provider in one county in the US changed the overall mortality of black peoples within that county. So there is no way that that single provider is providing primary care to all of those people there. But that idea of having someone who actually is going to be um, uh, over, you know, causing policy change, structural change, et cetera, and knowing that there, there is visibility of someone from your community in positions of decision-making authority is really important. Thank you. Um, Sarah, do you want to share your views? And the question was, should journals structure their boards to show the groups they are representing? Or should it be left for the readers and authors to figure that out by researching the board members' backgrounds? I think that they absolutely should, because right now it is left up to the reader. And 
with so many journals and organizations pledging to do better, you don't know if they're actually doing better if you don't have anything to track, if you don't have any data to track. Um, there have been articles about the makeup of boards or even authors in journals, but it's largely left to let's guess this person's race or ethnicity from their name, or let's Google them and try to find out their background. If we had more transparent information, then you could say we had XYZ number of people in 2020, but in 2025, we had this number and you can see the actual shifts and we can hold organizations accountable for the changes that they claim that they want to make. Thank you. Just as a kind of um, playing devil's advocate somewhat here, um, it, it, what about in terms of, so I think you're, you're suggesting that it's helpful to have people's um, sort of racial or ethnic backgrounds re represented or openly um, uh, displayed as part of their board member representation. What about people's sexuality or disability or um you know how what age you know what what about sort of those kind of areas where people may not feel comfortable or able to to share um their background um Rohan do you have thoughts on that well i I was looking at this from a slightly different perspective. Um, there can be no doubt that editorial boards and editors themselves, being human, have political and ideological biases. This, I think, we have to take as a given. And I suspect journals would try very hard to try and neutralize those biases as far as they can, but it's impossible to do. A place where it's really difficult to do is the area in which secrecy is essential, that is in the review process because the world never knows which reviewers you turn to. And if you turn to reviewers who themselves are systematically biased in some way, for example, I don't like to use the word systemic racism without knowing its full implications here, but for example, uh, no one would ever know. And this I think applies very strongly whenever journals especially get involved in editorializing or giving opinions on subjects of general interest, which happens increasingly now. So especially in the editorial process or the opinion process, I think it's important not to have anonymous peer review. I think reviewers should be told that they must stand up and be counted because they themselves might be biased and contributing to an opinion or an editorial viewpoint, which is totally at odds with the mainstream of humanity, just because the, the, the journal has selected bad reviewers. That's really interesting. And and um, Lisa, I can see you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, no, just to speak to your follow up question around um, is this appropriate to ask everyone? No, but what we have done in many uh, what's happening now because of the major health disparities that it continue to occur for certain groups in Canada is for institutions actually require their boards to have a skills based matrix. In, on their skill-based matrix of their board makeup is an understanding of certain of certain skill areas. And so when you're nominated for a board, if it's to, you know, to understand that there's a need to address um, Indigenous, understand Indigenous health in Canada, you know, that is a part of your role. That is the skill you're bringing in the new skills based matrix of the board. So we look, we recruit people for their legal expertise. We recruit people for their scientific expertise across disciplines. We actually have to be recruiting people. So if that's a part of what you're doing, that's important. And by the way, a single person is never enough, of course. Um, it, it's There's lots of plenty of literature that shows that you can't be a single, you know, having a single patient on a patient on, a, on an advisory council of a of a hospital is is not enough because it's not 
there's not safety in speaking up and it leads to that tokenization that we worry about. So you need, like on the, I'm a, on council of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, which is their board. And they've uh, changed their, their the skills matrix. We have um, indigenous peoples, we have black peoples, and we actually have peoples with disabilities because of, again, the emerging ongoing um, gaps that we're seeing. So it's reflecting the needs of our communities um, in in Canada, in terms of in terms of health. Thank you, and and Sarah, any any thoughts on on those issues that Lisa and Rohan have raised? Uh, to address your follow up question, I think it's important that people provide information optionally like at their own will it shouldn't be mandatory you shouldn't out someone um but also you can data uh, data could be provided sort of anonymized you can say you know the board is made up of you know x number of this and y number of that if people would feel safer having their their data pooled instead of saying you know like john doe is is this Thank you. And, and without wanting to get too sidetracked by practicalities, one of the issues that we're grappling with at SAGE right now is how to understand the um, the makeup of our editorial boards of the journals that we publish and to do that in a way that is appropriate and ethical and enables people to disclose or not and to identify as they wish. and. The, the best way we can think of doing that is by surveying our journal editorial board members. But inevitably with a survey, you will only ever get a, a sort of partial set of responses. So you will never, it's very hard to kind of um, achieve a, a true comprehensive, genuine understanding of, of the makeup of your editorial boards, certainly as a, for a publisher like Sage, who publishes sort of 1200 journals. Um, so yeah, I, I, any advice on that would be welcome, but it's perhaps a bit of a, a sidetrack from the from the topic of of this discussion. Um, just to kind of uh, jump back into the Q and A, um, there, there's a question here: whose responsibility should it be to check a paper for inclusive language? The author, the editor, the production people, or the publisher, or somebody else? And that's from an anonymous attendee. Um, Sarah, do you want to kick us off, please? Uh, yes, I think it should be the responsibility of everyone. Authors, you know, should try to to write as inclusively as impos as possible. But I think reviewers should also keep language in mind. Um, the GMA Network recently added a question to our reviewer score sheet about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. And it's optional. And I feel like the only people that respond to that question are people who are already reading papers with, um, with those issues in mind. But hopefully having that question helps prompt other reviewers um, to consider it. I think it ab absolutely should also be a responsibility of the editor you're you're already making sure that these papers are scientifically sound they should also be reading um with the language in mind and then when it goes through copy editing and production and um i don't know how it works at larger organizations but within the gma network our executive vice president touches almost every single paper that gets published and she picks up on a lot of these things Thank you. And I think um, one of the things that editors can also do is to have this on the agenda at editorial board meetings and to kind of really, um, so that again, it's it's about embedding some of this thinking, encouraging learning and discussion. Um, and, you know, it's not, no one of us has all the answers, but to kind of at least encourage that awareness and a shared responsibility amongst the editorial board is important. Um, Rohan, do you want to comment on that? 
it, and the question was about whose responsibility it is. Yes, I, well, I, well I, I agree basically with the comments that went before that it's everyone's responsibility. As, a, as an editor, subject editor myself for a journal, I often see reviewers pointing to language or ideas that may be offensive. Um, and so this is one way of picking up on problems. But at the end of the day, the editor is finally responsible for what gets on the printed page. And I think we have to hold editors to a very high standard. It's their job to make sure that nothing gets published that could possibly be offensive or detrimental to the interests of marginalized communities. I think this is very important. Editors, that the buck stops with the editor. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I agree. It's the, it's the responsibility of everyone. And I, I just want to highlight what we've already talked about and what I mentioned. This is, um, I, in, in my role, I end up managing a lot of, quote, concerns that come forward around experiences and mistreatment, whether it be related to language, interactions, behaviors. It's, it's not the favorite part of my job. What I prefer to do is actually to be creating proactively policy structures and ways in which we can change the culture where we're working. But my my big learning over the years as a leader has been really shifting from this pushing on people this is what you must do to to a place of learning and growth and that's why the guidelines sharing them and saying this is what we do this is what we're where where we're at not everybody makes mistakes and it's and and what we tend to see if we're doing that policing can't use this Oh, well, it's going to be censorship. You're going to, that, that will be the issue. So it's, this is the rationale for why we're proposing this. Let's uh, talk about it and, and uh, you know, let there be growth and learning as a result. And by the way, as we've said, I think Rohan points out, you know, you, you're not just certain, this is not just the editorial board that's determining what the language should be. These are, should be the preferred um, a, a language that's coming from within community communities so under explaining that rationale as well i think i think that's been probably where i've seen a shift in culture is when we when we go from making that an environment of oh policing censor censorship around uh behaviors and language to uh this is going to make the world the the space the institution the journal better for everyone and we all need to participate in that that's a great point, and it really speaks to the title of this session. Actually, is 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 inclusive language policing, or is it progressive? And I think you're advocating for a, a, a more inclusive and progressive approach. And um, we've got a comment from or a question from an anonymous attendee, which kind of really um, taps into what you were just saying. How do we handle authors? who feel there is no issue with their language, but which we as editors or publishers feel goes against the inclusivity standards of the journal or the publisher. At what point is it censorship if we continue advocating for the author to reconsider their language choices? And I guess imply, implied in that is perhaps there's been an effort to, to do that engagement that you're suggesting, Lisa, but the author is unwilling to make those changes. At, at what point does that does dialogue turn into censorship or, 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 you know, perhaps it comes down to editorial decision making around the policies of the journal? But Lisa, do you want to comment on that point? Um, ultimately, if if you feel the journal is going to be cause it, it will cause harm to others if it goes out. And so you ultimately the the um, the editor will be responsible for the harm that may be caused. So I think once you've give, there's been an opportunity for growth and, and understanding the change, um, as long as what you're clear around the principles of why you've made the decision, who's advised, this is where I would absolutely get, get other opinions from those from within the specific community, diverse peoples from within a specific group to understand and make sure that you've been very clear in the process of, of why you've made the decision that you've made. One, you've got your C4 disc guidelines or whatever they may be that you're adhering to. Number two, you actually um, have worked 
with the author to actually help them understand why you do that. Number three, you actually get uh, perspectives from numerous members of the specific community from which there may be concerns. And you've documented all of that. Like I'm in a leadership role, I have to say. I mean, I, I know what this is like. I understand what it means to be to be experiencing the uh, the challenges, uh, legal and otherwise then it's uh, you make the decision. And I think uh, we don't want we don't want um, more harm caused to thousands of readers because you haven't been able to be brave and make a stance that really adheres to the principles and guidance documents that you're adhering to. Thank you. Um, Rohan, what are your thoughts? I, I just wanted to add to that by saying that there's always been a standard on journals to be uh, civil and courteous when it comes to language. The imperatives of diversity, equity, and inclusion are relatively recent, and there's no reason we can't use that same practice that we've always had for more than a century of scientific publishing, in which we insist that discourse be civil. And if an author fails the civility test, I think you just don't publish them. This is, this is something that has to be laid down. I, it can be in the editorial guidelines of journals that if you don't know how to politely and respectfully convey your message, then you don't get published. It's as simple as that. I like that concept of civility. That, that's a great, great one to kind of keep at the heart of what we do. Sarah, what what do you what do you think? Um, I I agree. I think you, you know you can ask authors to change their language. Um, in my case, I happen to have you know an entire network and a style manual that has a very robust language section um, to to back us up. But at the end of the day, if it's something that goes against journal guidelines or is offensive it's probably not going to make it into the journal. And um, to some point, we will do some negotiation with authors on the language. And usually that is done by people higher up than myself. But if it's something that's really offensive, that's a clear cut. No, there's not going to be any negotiation on that. Thank you. Um, we have a question that's directed to you, Sarah. Um, are you aware of any guidance existing or in development related to ableism with examples beyond people first language? That is certainly important, but as a publisher, examples such as replacing C table X in manuscripts with refer to table X would help advocate for broad copy editing changes. Um. I know that C4DISC has the toolkit for disability equity in progress. I'm not aware of a timeline for that. And because I'm not part of that working group, I don't know how all encompassing it would be, um, but I hope it would address um, things like that. Um, I find the point that, that was made in the question very interesting. Um, about seeing versus referring to a table. Um, to my knowledge, I don't have knowledge of, of anything in the works aside from that disability toolkit. Thank you. Um, that sounds that, that sounds like it will be a great resource when it's available. Just um, another question from an anonymous attendee. What do you think about adding trigger warnings or editor notes to content where authors may include offensive language. Rohan. Um, I have a problem with this because we it's very difficult to judge uh, where offensive language will, or what will be seen as offensive by readers. I gave the example in my little talk about the what, I mean, James Watt, for example, and we, we use the what every, in everyday language, kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, and so on. He was after all a slave trader in part of his time. This is potentially an offensive word to some people, but it's almost unavoidable. So at what point do you start associating trigger warnings with, with that kind of language? It's, it's very difficult to expunge from everyday usage. 
and the time might come when we do this, but the time that time is not yet. So my advice would be for editors to avoid as far as possible any triggers that come to their attention. But there's only so far you can go because the, the range of potentially triggering words is limitless. And, and you have to draw the line somewhere and that should be the editorial discretion. That, that is the job you have as an editor to, to make that call. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, what are your thoughts? And the question was, what do you think about adding trigger warnings or editor's notes to content where authors may include offensive language? Um, I agree with, with Rohan. It's it's a potentially endless endeavor. And and where do you where do you draw the line? Um, I'm aware of some initiatives of going back and labeling previously published like historical papers that may have offensive language. For example, GMA Psychiatry and GMA Neurology, um, who were originally the archives of neurology and psychiatry, which started publication in 1919. And obviously language has evolved since then. Um, but even that is a large undertaking and it's, some of it I think is common sense, like, people should know that language that was acceptable in the 1950s is not necessarily acceptable today. Um, but I still think it's hard. Where where do you draw the line on, on labeling these things? Absolutely. And, and certainly that's something that I've been sort of grappling with as COPE's DEIA subcommittee chair, we're, we're developing a discussion document on um, offensive content in the archive. And I think there's, um, it's really important not to sort of pretend that certain ideas or, or, or language didn't exist and, and to, to a certain extent to treat those articles as artifacts. Um, but it's, it's also possible for, historical articles to be causing harm now so it's yeah it, that's again a, a whole other um area of discussion um lisa did you have any thoughts on trigger warnings or editor's notes trigger warnings will not should not uh, um allow for problematic language so i it, it, like the language needs to be um it um as inclusive as possible um and, and we've seen some nice examples of of how to be guided in that and i think some ideas around when there's complexity there how to to sort that out so uh no like trigger warnings don't work for, for this i think um for content yes but um that is uh, you know, that's different and so when you're looking for example at archival content you know, a general statement up at the very beginning, recognizing how language has evolved, there may be problematic, but that doesn't need to be attached to every single um, piece. It's just a reminder to the reader, look, you're going back to, you're going to read the, you know, the language around the Tuskegee experimentation, for example, it's, it's awful, but, you know, we go back to it because it's so important in terms of, in terms of understanding what's happening right now. So um, I think, I think one needs to, it, it it does not excuse um, being careful around language choice. Thank you. Um, we're coming close to the end of our session. Um, I'm just going to um, raise one final question from uh, from the participants. Um, would you foresee editors being able to reject or even retract an article? Due to, due to offensive language when the authors, which the authors would not change if the science is solid or valid still. Um, Lisa. Uh, well, to me, I would question the validity of the science in that case, because I questioned the framing and some of the exam, you know, some of the guidelines in, in Sarah's document around how what has been the foundational framework that has led 
to the authors, the scientists who are actually even exploring and pursuing this line of questioning and this way of thinking. And so what I, I really, um, I'm, I'm trying to help uh, a, a shift in the institutions where I work to understand the EDIIA, which is the way we phrase it, equity, diversity, inclusion, indigeneity, accessibility, because we re realized we weren't necessarily specifically addressing some of those, uh, those specific areas um, in the I and the A at the end, we, uh, it has to be integrated into everything that we do, including into the science. Are we, in, are we actually including diverse representation in our recruitment process like so so to me someone who's unwilling to change actually i would i would be quite concerned about what are the underlying assumptions that it have informed their work thank you we've got one more minute left rohan sarah do you have um any particular thoughts on that question um briefly rohan um i i think we, we also have to factor into this the, the fact that for a long time we've had uh, ethics policies in journals which have worked very well and if a if a paper doesn't meet ethical standards i think it's fine to retract it this has been the practice for a long time so i think that option is still available the the one thing i think we need to also factor into our thinking is that quite often people have different opinions based on factors like race and gender. And for, for example, I published a paper recently looking at reforms in scientific language, and I had a lot of responses to that. Out of 120 emails I received from strangers, there was one from a woman, 119 from men. And I can't understand why. There's, there's nothing, I didn't, re, I didn't reference gender in my paper in, even indirectly. So there are things going on here which are different. Our, perspe our perspectives differ depending on factors like race and gender. And I think we need to be sensitive to that and think a bit further um, as, as to what exactly the meanings of the words that we use are to the people who hear them. This, this is something I think we need to pay increasing attention to. Thank you. Sarah, any very quick thoughts from you? Um, yes, I agree with what both Rohan and Lisa have said, but just to give a quick bottom line, I don't know that a paper would be retracted for language only because I don't think that it would have gotten to that point. Um, I think a small correction like we recently did would be possible, but I, I don't think that we would allow a paper with such offensive language that it would be retracted for that language to even be published in the first place um, because it it just wouldn't meet with the the journal's guidelines and standards thank you so much um well this has been such a fascinating and powerful discussion i really appreciate all of your time today Rohan, Sarah, Lisa, you've all brought so many interesting insights and perspectives to us. Um, thank you so much. And thank you also to people who've raised questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to cover all of them, um, but we're already over time. Um, so um, I will wrap this session up now. And thank you again to our wonderful panellists. Bye.